Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Emma Mertens, and I'm the Program Manager of Community Relations at IDF. <coughs> we would like to welcome you to the session, Hemophagocytic Lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH. Before we begin, I would like to read a brief disclaimer. The Immune Deficiency Foundation IDF education events offer a wide array of educational presentations, including presentations developed by healthcare and life management professionals invited to serve as presenters. The views and opinions expressed by guest speakers do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of IDF. The information presented during this event is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during the event. At this time, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Ashish Kumar from Cincinnati Children's. Well, thank you for this invitation and uh, thanks everybody who has joined this session today. Uh, as Emma mentioned, um, my name is Ashish Kumar. I'm at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, just before we begin, uh, get into it, uh, uh, just some disclosures. Um, I am a consultant for a company called Sobi, another one called Farming. And as Emma mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the session is more so for your education and providing general information about this disease that we call HLH. It is not uh, to give specific medical advice or recommendations for individuals. So please keep that in mind. We're going to briefly cover um, the knowledge and the current state of treatment for HLH. And then I will be happy to answer questions as many as uh, they may be and depending on what those questions are. Uh, so let's uh, dive right into it. So what is HLH? It's a mouthful. If you split the word, the first word hemophagocytic comes from the word heme, which means blood. And phagocytic refers to a cell that eats. And so in the disease HLH, one of the observations seen under the microscope by pathologists was that they saw cells that were eating blood cells. That's where the word hemophagocytic or hemophagocytosis comes from. The second um, letter in the abbreviation lymphocytosis um, refers to expansion of lymphocytes. And then the final word histiocytosis refers to expansion of a type of cell in our tissues called a tissue macrophage. So these are the elements in this condition, HLH. You have hemophagocytosis, you have expansion of lymphocytes, and you have expansion of tissue macrophages. That is, in a nutshell, the description of the name of this disease. It still doesn't tell you what is it then. Well, this may come as a surprise to most of you that it is not a single diagnosis or a single disease, but rather, it's a description of clinical manifestation of many different underlying problems. And they all have one thing in common, that is uh, the presence of extensive systemic inflammation. Now, what is inflammation in case some of you are not aware? Inflammation is our immune system's natural protective mechanism. That's how it attacks things that are foreign to us by using inflammation. So when there is extensive systemic inflammation or uncontrolled systemic inflammation, that is when we start calling it HLH. And there are many different types of HLH, and we'll get to that next. The most common one that probably this audience um, is familiar with is one that is called primary HLH, which is a congenital uh, disorder of the immune system caused by defects in what we call the cytotoxic immune response. Now I'll get to that a little more about that in a minute. Almost all of genetic forms of HLH are autosomal recessive, which means that you must have two 
defective copies of a gene in order to manifest the disease. A single defective copy makes one a carrier and usually has no impact on the individual's health, which is why it's a silent carrier, which is what I have shown here in this slide. So what you have here is um, the parents, uh, a mother and a father, both of who are, whom are carriers, so they each carry one defective copy of the same gene, but it does not cause any disease in them. If they have a child together, there's a 25% chance because each of us carries two copies of each gene. We inherit one from our mother, one from our father. And each of us will transmit one of our uh, genetic copies to our child. So if you put those odds together, there is a 25% chance that the child will not have any defective copies of that gene. There's a 50% chance that they will carry one defective copy, either the one that they inherited from the mother or from the father. And there's a 25% chance, a one in four chance, that the child will inherit both defective copies of that one gene, which will then lead to the absence of a normal copy of that gene, which is important in functioning of the cytotoxic immune response, which then leads to the disease that we call primary HLH. Okay. There are a few, one of, there is one other type of transmission that can also happen, and that is called X-linked. In this case, the, the defective gene happens to sit on the X chromosome. And just thinking back to biology 101, um, females have two X chromosomes, whereas males only have one X chromosome. So if a woman has one defective copy on her X chromosome, she will be unaffected. Um, if she has children, if she has a female child, there is a 50% chance that that female child will be a carrier because she will only receive one copy of that X chromosome from this woman, from her mother. Or it's possible that the mother will transmit the normal copy um, of that X chromosome to her female offspring, to her daughter, in which case the daughter will not even be a carrier. On the other hand, if it's a boy, remember that boys only get one X chromosome. So the boy will inherit the Y chromosome from the father and the X chromosome from the mother. Now there's a 50% chance that the boy may inherit a defective copy or a normal copy. And if he inherits the normal copy, again, will not be a carrier because only the mother carries this gene. However, if this boy inherits the defective X chromosome from his mother, since he does not have another X chromosome to compensate for it, he will be affected by this disease. So there can be two types of inheritance patterns. One is autosomal recessive, which does not depend on the gender or sex of the child. Um, it is uh, purely dependent on um, the parents being carriers. And uh, it's a one in four chance of the child being affected. And the other one is X-linked, in which case, almost always, it's only the boys who are affected and there's a 50-50 chance, depending on which X chromosome they inherit from their mother. So we now know of uh, almost all the genes uh, that are transmitted either in the X-linked pattern or the autosomal recessive pattern that are associated with HLH. Those of you who are familiar with these uh, may know this uh, table. This is now oh, 10 years old, but the information is largely unchanged. Uh, listed here are all the genes that I was talking about. Um, and uh, these are the names of the genes on the left. Uh, in the middle column are the chromosomes on which they reside. And close to the bottom, if you see here, are the two genes, the SH2D1A and the XIAP, both of which are on the X chromosome. And so all the other ones are autosomal recessive. These two are X-linked. So that is a primary HLH. Now, there are other varieties of HLH as well. Now, this one is called EBV HLH. EBV is the virus that causes mono. 
Most of us have been exposed to it at some time or the other in our lives. The estimate is that 95% of the adult population in the world has been exposed to EBV. In most of us, we suffer a mild illness, although during when we are in the throes of mono, it may not seem that mild, but we do recover from it. Sometimes, however, EBV itself can trigger HLH. And there are a couple different examples. The first one is in the boys who carry the X-linked type of HLH, the HLH, the HLH gene uh, mutation, uh, the disease can be triggered if they're exposed to EBV. And that can be both either of the two X-linked conditions, either XIAP or the other one, XLP or SAP deficiency. Outside of the genetic uh, varieties of HLH, there's another very fascinating but peculiar condition. And this tends to affect people from the East Asian or Latino ethnicity. So people from China, Japan, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, East Asia, basically, and then Central and South America. In some of these individuals, the EBV virus, instead of, normally it affects a type of white cell called the B lymphocyte. In these individuals, it can enter the T cell or the NK cell, and it can turn them into cancerous. Yes. Uh, the virus is capable of inducing a cancer. This is one of the rare examples in when it can happen. And essentially what then happens is that these individuals develop a T or NK cell lymphoma. And this looks identical to HLH. And that's why it is sometimes called EBV HLH. And in these individuals who are of East Asian or uh, Latinx uh, ethnicity, there have been no genetic mutations that have been identified. It's just a quirk of chance that seems to happen, but there's something in their uh, genetic makeup that is biologically similar that somehow predisposes them to suffer these uh, lymphoma-like diseases that then look just like HLH. There are a few other types of HLH. One is called macrophage activation syndrome. This happens in young children who um, suffer from autoimmune diseases such as juvenile idiopathic arthritis, known as JIA. There's a form of it known as systemic JIA, either way, it's JIA. And you may have, of course, heard of lupus. There's another type of autoimmune disease called mixed connective tissue disease. It doesn't matter which one it is. These are all systemic inflammatory diseases. And sometimes during this autoimmune disease, um, there is a sudden surge of inflammation. And recall what I told you that if you have severe inflammation, that is when you develop um, the severe illness, which is an extreme form of inflammation, that is HLH. So when children who have these autoimmune diseases have a surge of inflammation, it looks identical to, and it essentially is the same as HLH because you have extensive inflammation. And then there are there is this terminology called secondary HLH. What this refers to is that many individuals, especially adults, when they have an infection or sometimes malignancies, cancers such as leukemia or lymphoma, they manifest a large inflammation more than what is normally seen in most individuals with that same infection or the same malignancy. And this has been labeled as a secondary HLH, although I dislike the term because it is confusing, because there is no underlying genetic defect or genetic predisposition. We don't understand the complete biology, although we are beginning to. The, the culprit here is the infection or the cancer. It's not the immune system that is the problem, which is completely different than uh, primary HLH or the macrophage activation syndrome, where the immune system is the root cause of the problem. Here, it's the infection or the cancer that is the root cause of the problem. And so when I keep referring to this extensive inflammation, what does it look like? How do doctors diagnose it? What do patients suffer? And what most of the 
the physician community nowadays utilizes to diagnose HLH are what are called the HLH 2004 diagnostic criteria. These were first developed uh, for a clinical trial run by the Histiocyte Society back in 2004. And what these criteria stipulated is that, you know, sometimes there is a family history either owing to an X-linked condition or the autosomal recessive where one child was already affected and we know which genes it were. So if we know that and we can test those genes in another child who's looking sick, and if we find them, then that child meets the diagnosis of HLH. But many times there is no family history because you know, even in autosomal recessive, it's one in four chances. So it, it is quite rare. The clinical manifestations of HLH, which are the symptoms of severe inflammation are what are listed on this table. And if you notice, they're not very specific. They can be seen in many conditions. Hence, there's a lot of confusion in getting to the diagnosis of HLH. And those are listed here. They are, you know, fever and enlarged spleen, uh, low blood counts, that is anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, lack of blood cells, elevated levels of triglyceride or reduced levels of fibrinogen, Presence of hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow, spleen, or lymph node. Remember, this is what the first word in the abbreviation of the acronym HLH. And then some specialized tests. One is a absent NK cell function. It's a very cumbersome, difficult test that we actually don't use anymore. An elevated ferritin and an elevated soluble IL-2 receptor alpha, also known as L soluble CD25. So these are the features that make us think that this patient may be suffering from HLH. Unfortunately, they don't tell us the difference whether this is um, the primary genetic type of HLH, EBV HLH, macrophage activation syndrome, or cancer or infection associated HLH. These clinical features cannot tell the difference between the subtypes of HLH. And knowing that is important. And that's because uh, what, we've under, what we've learned in the last few years is that these diagnostic criteria are actually outdated. They're not very specific. I just told you that they cannot distinguish between what's primary HLH versus what's an infection or a malignancy. We now have a much better understanding of the biology of HLH. And with that, we now have newer diagnostic tools and approaches that have made the diagnosis more accurate and reliable. Those clinical criteria, they are useful in thinking about HLH, but they're not sufficient to make the complete diagnosis. What we really need to do is understand what is the underlying driver, whether it is a genetic type or something else, because that will then decide how we treat the patient, whether it is a child or an adult. And so how do we treat them? Well, if it is primary HLH, the genetic kind, we need to bring this inflammation under control typically using potent anti-inflammatory drugs like high doses of steroids, sometimes chemotherapy like etoposide. And then once we bring it under control, since it is a, a primary genetic problem, uh, as soon as you bring it under control, once you stop the therapy, it's gonna happen again because it's a defect in the immune system. That immune system needs to be replaced with a normal one. And, that child then needs to undergo bone marrow transplant to preserve their health and life. If it is the EBV associated HLH, which remember it's really a lymphoma, we treat the lymphoma with chemotherapy. And then often these individuals also have to undergo bone marrow transplant because this lymphoma cannot be eliminated or completely eradicated with chemotherapy alone. It can be brought under control, but then in order to get rid of it, bone marrow transplant is often necessary. Now the macrophage activation syndrome, which happens in autoimmune conditions, there uh, usually the inflammation can be controlled with medication and can be kept under control. There are rare instances where um, children with macrophage activation syndrome have had to undergo transplant, um, but majority of the time we're able to control that inflammation with medications alone. And then finally, that entity that I told you about, the secondary HLH, where the HLH is secondary to an infection or a malignancy, there 
the treatment should be focused on what's driving the disease, what's driving the HMH, which is usually an infection or a lymphoma. That is what needs to be treated, not the HMH. If you treat the infection or the lymphoma, the HMH part will go away by itself. Okay. That is a brief overview that I wanted to share with you. And I will end my presentation here and now open up to you guys for questions and I will stop sharing. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Kumar. All right, so as Dr. Kumar mentioned, now we will get started with the Q&A session. And give it a few moments for some questions to come through. All right, it looks like we just had a question come through. How often does an HLH diagnosis with other, oh, um, occur with other PIs? With other PIs, with other primary immune deficiencies. Yes, it does. Um, and because what happens is many other primary immune deficiencies are associated with the risk for infections. And any infection that goes rampant or unchecked can lead to severe inflammation, which will then lead to all the manifestations that we typically associate with HLH, or as um, we like to say, they will fulfill the diagnostic criteria for HLH. And uh, so it does happen typically if the infection goes unrecognized, unchecked, or the PI was not diagnosed. One of the very first patients that I diagnosed with HLH early on in my career, ended up actually having uh, X-linked egg hemoglobinemia, um, and, uh, which was unknown. We did not know that uh, this child suffered from XLA and uh, then developed a severe adenovirus infection, which set off a full-blown inflammation that looked exactly like HLH, but uh, eventually what happened is we found the adenovirus and then that led to the diagnosis of XLA instead. So that child did not need a bone marrow transplant, just needed treatment for the adenovirus and the XLA and then the HLH was gone. So it does happen. It's not very frequent, um, but it's another one of those things that uh, physicians need to keep in mind that uh, the, the label or the description of HLH is not sufficient as a diagnosis in itself. Uh, we need to look for what's causing it underlying and make sure we treat that first. All right, thank you, Dr. Kumar. It looks like that was our one question. Um, we'll give it a few more moments in case anyone else has one. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Kumar. Um, for volunteering your time and we really appreciate your efforts putting this presentation together. Um, if there aren't any more questions, our session is about to come to a close, um, but we look forward to seeing everyone at the next session, which is swimming upstream, addressing payer challenges and ensuring access to genetic testing, which will begin at 315. So thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of your day.